far cry from those uber-physical Nike ads, Ferrero have signed up the stars of the German football team to plug a very different product. In their latest commercial, Hamburg striker Benny Lauf is encouraged to be lazy for the love of Nutella. And now let's have a good breakfast. Benny, you have something. After working at V in New York and for photographer Mario Testino in Paris, Hugh Gwyther had a bright idea for a magazine of his own, with a little financial help from the BBC's Dragon's Den. Wonderland isn't just a luxury publication. To me, it's very much a destination. It's a place you want to be. It's very much fashion and visual culture. The reader is an age between about 25 and 45, relatively affluent, and who can live, to a certain degree, the lifestyle that we're, you know, illustrating. It's a very sort of switched-on readership. It's very important that Wonderland becomes its own luxury brand. Wonderland will be launched later this year. On Holland's VPRO channel comes Cakers, a series of amusing, impenetrable short films and animations. Inspired by the fluid format of 70s TV, it's designed to teach Dutch children visual language. When it comes to sugary pop, the Koreans are the calorie kings. But in the video for their latest release, using that old cute chicks analogy, Roller Coaster explore the dark underbelly of life through the medium of thumping disco. Sunsick is out, now on import. Brand watchers had a busy week, what with that Blackberry malarkey starring political spinmeister Alistair Campbell, the handheld computer and some spectacular swearing in an email to the BBC. Blackberry's intuitive software kicked in to help with the swear words, but couldn't help Campbell with the word political. Will his latest silly fuss help sell more Blackberries? And IKEA's marketing department must be wondering if they've experienced the UK's first brand riot when 6,000 customers turned up for the opening of their new Edmonton North London store. One person stabbed and 70 injured is not the news founder Ingvar Kamprad wanted to wake up to. Fashion brands are particularly vulnerable of being adopted by the wrong crowd. The industry is still chewing over what went wrong recently for one British fashion icon and what the broader lessons are for those whose job it is to build and protect those big names. Brand is everything. It's the way a retailer dresses their windows, the color used for shopping bags, the logo type for an automobile, and the font chosen for a shop front. For the fashion industry, it's an exercise in total control, where nothing is left to chance and attention to detail verges on the obsessive. With so much attention on maintaining and building a brand, what happens when it all goes terribly wrong? When, despite a brand's best intentions to woo the right audience, their label is adopted by the wrong crowd? Do they rip up the strategy? Do they bar customers from entering the shops? Or do they send out the hit squads to go and reclaim their brand? For one iconic UK fashion house, their signature print has become the unofficial logo for a tribe of consumers who have arguably contributed to eroding the brand's status in the United Kingdom. Despite the adoption of Burberry by the Chav, the company is still enjoying a healthy bottom line. Burberry is the Chav brand. Burberry signifies membership of this club, and this club signifies, in some ways, something not dissimilar to kind of trailer trash, white trash in the US. It's a similar sort of feel. It's very sad when a brand makes a mistake of associating itself so strongly with one actually very small signature, and it provided an entry-level product so a customer could come in and buy a piece of the brand and that was what it was all about a baseball cap a baseball cap a scarf a baby buggy and on we went and i think there's there's clearly uh, a case of you know the wrong crowd picking on a very you know distinct logo and holding on to it uh it, i mean it's a little bit of bad luck. Right. What does a brand do when that happens? I mean, if the wrong crowd starts to drive your car, they embrace your sweaters, they love your scarves, what, what do you do? I, th I think, I mean, it's very tricky, uh, in a, a very tricky situation. I think in, in, control your distribution. I mean, that's the, that's the number one. It's just like, 
uh, you have to give up some sales effectively and try to uh, move away from that crowd. Burberry is a very interesting case. It's had a terrible uh, uh, coverage in the media in recent months, as we all know, the linked with the Chavs and all that. But of course, the UK is a relatively small part of the overall market. And of course, the way we look at fashion brands does vary from region to region around the world. So in much of Asia, there is still a greater interest in the sort of logos that we were all excited about a few years ago. And Burberry is a very, very strong label with immense potential in Asia. And the fact that it's having a bit of local difficulty in the UK doesn't really have me much to say about its global performance. If overexposure is a brand killer for the premium sector, who's got it right? What label has managed to steer clear of attracting the wrong crowd, and how have they done it? I think on the whole it's incredibly difficult to control a brand because what you want to do, you want to sell. What you want, to, you know, how you're going to sell? By getting your name out there. There are m thousands of brands now. There are designers I've never even heard of. You know, you have to scream very loud. So it's very hard for them to say, actually, we're going to take a dive in profits this year. We don't mind because it will keep the brand pure and fresh. I mean, Prada does do that. And you can't have bouncers outside the doors um, and keep keep tacky looking people out. Well, you know, you can. Voyage did it, as we know. And didn't they get a backlash? You know, I think it's a very, very fine line. And I, that's why it, it does come back to Prada. They, they, they've controlled it by keeping it a little bit off-center, not too mainstream. I mean, you know, say not too mainstream. It sells $600 million a year. But actually, that, that's probably quite small in the grand scheme of things. For the overexposed, is there salvation? Can a brand, no matter how tarnished, recover in the minds of consumers? You can always bring a brand back. There is no doubt about that. You may have to be patient, and a lot of people in the fashion business aren't patient. They want instant success. They think they can bring in a designer, a hotshot designer, do a couple of great seasons, they're back on the front page. It's not necessarily. You have to be patient, and you, we have to sort of think a bit more long-term about brand building, in my view. I think there's a, a potential bold other strategy, which is called hugging the gorilla. I mean, the street has always informed fashion. I think if Burberry could have a look at some really definitive working class heroes of perhaps the last sort of, you know, two to three years, there are some wonderful examples of people who are, you know, fantastic heroes from the street. And why not bring on the chavalry? <laughs> Now, joining me to discuss brand salvation is the author of On Brand, chairman of Saffron Brand Consultants, Wally Olins, and also have to say the godfather of branding. In that piece, Wally, Roger Treadry of WGSN said that you can always salvage a brand no matter how damaged. Would you agree with that? I don't think all brands are right for reinvention. Uh, if you look at one or two political brands, like, for example, the Nazi Party or the Communist Party, uh, there wasn't much they could do to, sell, to, to, uh, to save them at the end of the day, was there? So I think that if you think in terms of uh, the reality behind the brand, if the reality behind the brand really collapses, then of course you can't save the brand. So I, I think that um, in the case of a fashion brand, provided you change the reality so that it gets in line with what people actually want, then there is a good chance that you can change it. But you've got to be clear that the image and the reality are in line with each other. If you look at Burberry specifically, um, and there was several solutions offered up in that film. Is it just about playing with price, cutting back on distribution, or, or are there other tools that you can use? I think that it's uh, a lot to do with playing with price and looking at distribution, but there are certain other tools you can use. For example, you can do, uh, you can introduce brands which are super brands, which are versions, which are variations of the Burberry name. Uh, you can um, do things about design and cutting-edge design, which will mean that you will focus on a certain type of audience and you won't focus on other kinds of audience. So there are lots of mechanisms that you can use, I think, to bring the brand back. And I think that Burberry's not really in serious danger at all. If they, there's, they've got a lot of opportunities of changing things and getting it right back to where they ought to be. On the point of national identity, you're working with Poland, I believe, right. at the moment. Uh, tell us about that exercise. Well, the basis of the thing is that most people in Western Europe regard every country in Eastern Europe as a kind of part of a grey sludge and they can't tell the difference between one and another. So Yugoslavia or whatever it may be is just one kind of place somewhere. 
So the issue is to enable Poland to compete, in other words, to get people to know Poland, to get people to buy Polish products, to get people to invest in Poland, and to get people to visit Poland from a tourism point of view. Would you say, is it the role of an agency like yours to actually give a country an entirely new face, or should it be the role of government? Shouldn't there be a ministry in there who should be doing the job? I think this isn't so much a question of giving a country a new face. The issue is to find out what the reality is and to enable the country itself to project that reality. What we do is to facilitate that. Let's spin the globe very quickly. Wally Olin's top five brands, or three or four, the ones that you really respect. Oh, gosh, that's a terribly difficult one. I do, I have to say to start with, I do, I used to love the Citroen brand because the products that Citroen produced, the Deus and the Deux Chevaux were remarkable and they were part of a remarkable tradition going back to the 30s, Traxim Avon, all that kind of thing. And I think another brand that's very interesting is Samsung because we know far more about Samsung than we do about the country it comes from. Everybody knows about Samsung, but not many people know about Korea, whereas that wasn't true. It's certainly not true, let's say, of Mercedes-Benz in Germany, where the, where the relationship is symbiotic. But in Samsung, Korea doesn't, may just as well not exist. Wally Lins, thanks for joining us.